Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm uh, an experience designer. I, I design experiences for a living, and I believe an experience should do three, one of three really important things to you. Uh, the first thing should, which would be that it should play with your senses in some way. It should make you feel something you've never felt before. Uh, in a similar respect, it should make you uh, like, like, uh, receive a sensa uh, an emotional response that you've never had before, make you feel in a certain way emotionally. And the third thing it should do is it should make you see something in a different way. It should teach you something. You should, you should uh, learn a lesson of some sort. And I want to, tell you, I want to show you one of my favorite pieces of experience design um, ever. This is, uh, this is a piece of immersive theater that's been going for several years called You, Me, Bum, Bum, Train. And um, it's, actually, it's actually incredible. I don't, it's actually quite secret, so I don't really want to talk too much about it. But uh, essentially, the idea is you go through different scenarios, but you go on your own. So you're just you're, you're there yourself, and there's a huge, enormous cast of actors around working around you. So, you know, like for like, they can get 40 people through a night, but it, it takes a cast of 200 to do it. But the thing that's brilliant about this, the thing that's really cool, is people come out afterwards and they say, oh, well, that was the best thing I've ever done in my life. Like, the best thing they've ever done in their life. Like, how incredible is that? How cool is that? Like, some people went and designed a thing, and then it, and then it exists, and it's the best thing people have ever done. Why, why are we talking more about that? Why isn't that a theme that comes up more often? Why aren't <clears throat> designers looking at doing things that way? Uh, I thought that was really cool. But what does that have to do with the city? Well, I'm going to show you a project that uh, we're working on at the moment, which is called Hello Lamppost. Uh, yeah, there was a Playable City Commission, which was set up by some guys called Watershed, really cool arts organization in Bristol. And they wanted to talk about making Bristol a playable city. And the, the idea of the playable city is it's supposed to be a counterpoint to the smart city as a kind of like a discussion point. And the idea we pitched was called Hello Lamppost, which I don't know if you know, is like a, apparently it's a Simon and Garfunkel lyric. We didn't actually realize that when we came up with the name. That was a com complete coincidence. Um, so uh, when we came up with this idea, it was based on two observations that we made. The first one was that um, the uh, cities are like big geographic diaries. You know, you walk around them and you remember stuff because you were there before. So it's it, like there's, and there's nothing really quite as powerful as that remembrance when you're in that situation. So you might be walking along and oh, there's that restaurant where I went on the first day, or oh, there's my friend's house. We used to stay up till two in the morning there playing StarCraft, or oh, there's that alleyway where been drinking these cheap strawberry daiquiris, and I was just vomiting this kind of, you know, projectile vomiting this pink goop all over the place. So you get all that kind of thing. The, the second observation was that the city is just absolutely covered in items of street furniture which have numbers on them or alphanumeric codes on them, which are really useful for referencing stuff. So uh, they became like the, so, like, the, the, like the location points for people to have conversations around. So the idea is you send a text message to a lamppost or uh, a post box or a street light with a little reference code. And then you get a message back of, of something, some uh, messages that someone else has sent to that same thing. So even though we set up little questions and things for people to answer, really, we're not, create, we're not authoring any content. Everything comes from other people and what they decide to share. And when we're looking into this, we got quite interested generally in the idea of what a more experiential city might be, what a more playful city might be and uh, get really excited when the, I get any kind of indication that people are maybe becoming a little bit more experientially focused. And that seems to be happening uh, through a form of conspicuous consumption, which is kind of being helped along by digital media and social media. So what's, what seems to be happening is, like, if you take the old idea of conspicuous consumption, you know, like the, you, uh, you, use, you purchase goods and services to express your identity and your social status. And it used to be like you had this kind of like very nuclear family keeping up the Joneses image of, you know, looking over your neighbor's fence and coveting their car or their house or whatever. That's kind of like, I'm not, that's not going to weigh, that's not like stop, but maybe it's being slightly moved on into something else now, which is this kind of, there's a big plate of ribs I ate once. Uh, so you've got this kind of uh, Facebook, Instagram thing now where people are sharing the, uh, the meals they've had or the holidays that they've been on or the, the crazy parties that apparently some people get invited to. And um, so that's kind of one thing that's happening. Another thing that's changing because of digital media or helping out is um, the way that people shop. So uh, you get this situation now where uh, a lot of people are shopping online more than they're shopping in retail spaces. And the high street, you know, the main street, the, the retail sector is having to deal with this and cope with this. So uh, there was a report uh, published Last week, it was all in all the papers in the UK saying that uh, in the next five years, 60,000 of our shops could close. So that's like a fifth of all the shops in the UK could just disappear. Um, 
which is terrifying. Like, that's really scary. Like, what's going to happen? Like, we, we worry about what, what are people's jobs going to, what are people going to, you know, where are people going to work? It's, it's a really scary situation. But with all due respect, there's maybe something really interesting there. There's maybe something really exciting. You know, this could be an opportunity for us to completely reimagine the way that our city centre is used. And um, I wanted to kind of use an analogy for what the future might be. Um, so, and like an art historian will probably say this is a gross oversimplification, but the, in the advent, like painting used to be the way of representational realism. You know, if you wanted to see what someone looked like in the past, you check out a painting. Uh, and, and photography slowly came in, it slowly developed the technology and then kind of like displaced that, that use for art, but it didn't kill art, it didn't shackle uh, fine art uh, at all. What happened as a consequence is that people, artists were able to experiment more and, and try stuff out and become more abstract and you, you, know, you end up with a wonderful modern art movement. Um, so what's the equivalent for the city? How's the, how's the future of the city going to change and evolve? And I think, yes, on the one hand, we've got the world, you know, the real world, and we've got the internet, and they are, they're not quite as discreet as they used to be. They are merging together and you're bringing together elements of both, which are kind of, you know, like we're finding technology on ourselves, in our environments and embedded. But I still think that the key to what the value of a future city will be is the stuff that can't be replicated digitally, that can't be done more efficiently or better in digital. And I think that really important key thing is proximity. Um, and it's proximity to other people. You know, it's, like, you know this, it's the difference between you being on Skype or talking to a person face to face. But it's also the proximity to the tangible cultural outputs that they produce, you know, the other things that people are doing. And one of the wonderful things about living in a large city is that you get to sample all the different things that everyone's doing. And that's fantastic because, as a consequence, you get a more enriched lifestyle. So I think that could be that's a really interesting direction. What's happening at the moment? Well, there's a really uh, popular idea that seems to be growing at the moment called experiential retail, um, which is the idea of taking the experience of shopping and making it into a more experiential thing, you know, turning shopping into a day out, uh, a leisurely pursuit. And uh, this is an example of uh, technology being used to do that. So this is a metro station in South Korea where they've, they've got you QR codes and you kind of like, you know, uh, you can scan the items or whatever. There's other stuff that people can do. So you can do, uh, you can do like more events in shops or you can like improve customer service or product sampling or bring in other things that definitely have an experiential value like cafes and restaurants and bars and bring them in and make them more of the shopping experience. That's fine, that's okay, but I can't help but feel that as denizens, like citizens of our cities, we are slightly shortchanged by that. Because really, there's, there isn't any sincerity in a retail experience. Basically, it's just set up to get you to buy something and take it away with you. You know, the, it's a means to an end. And uh, that seems kind of rubbish to me. So there's a problem of, it's not an issue of uh, like consumerism. You know, the, it's not like, I'm not saying that it's bad to consume, consuming's cool. You know, like we consume culture through storytelling and art and music and meals and that kind of thing. The problem here is a kind of um, institutionalized material fetishism. So it's, you know, buy this thing, own this thing. And what's the alternative to that? Well, I reckon, well, I don't reckon this is a, this is a general broader idea. Uh, it would be really cool if, uh, shopping centers were, were instead being used for purely experiential basises. So, you know, it's, it's all about, you've got these different competing groups and parties all working, well, com competing against each other to bring the most brilliant possible experiences together, and they're all fighting over you coming along and doing their thing. So rather than going shopping and you come back afterwards, like with your arms, like, you know, full of shopping bags, you come back with a whole new range of memories. And it's all about, um, it's not a means to an end, it is the end itself. I think that could be a really interesting possible way that maybe the, the our city centers could go. Now that, okay, maybe that's a little bit naive, maybe that's a little bit kind of like, can that scale, will that happen? But there is a really good community of creative people emerging who are doing incredible, fascinating things. Because, of course, you can, you know, it would be great to keep all the existing things we understand, you know, theater, cinema, uh, what else, uh, bowling, you know, laser tag, karaoke, that's all great. But imagine if we, like, we also have like, all these things of break typologies, things that don't already exist, that we can't name. You know, trying experiments with different things, with toying with emotion in food, or toying with like, the real life location, but then the benefits of having digital elements and all that kind of thing. So, and a, there is a really good community of uh, writers and actors and uh, uh, musicians and restaurateurs 
and game designers and hackers, all doing really cool, interesting stuff that doesn't fit in any convenient little box, but is out there and should be played around with. I want to show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is the School of Life. So these guys are a social enterprise. They've been around for quite a few years. Um, but they do these brilliant kind of typology breaking things. One of the things they do, which is amazing, is they do these meals where you, you, you pop along, you go on your own, so you don't bring anyone with you, and you talk to strangers. But the, and they, they have like a concept meal that you sit down and eat, so you're eating this special meal. But you're also talking to people at the same time, and they have like a menu of conversation topics. So you've got this sensory stimulation with the food, but you've also got this intellectual stimulation from the conversation, and they work really nicely together. Really interesting project. Another cool thing is the Google Web Lab, which is being used at the, it's at the Science Museum at the moment in London. It's, I think it's open for another month or so. And you know, it's a good example of a, of a brand doing something maybe which isn't, doesn't have a, like a, an ulterior motive to it. You don't have to go out and buy Google Mail at the end or whatever. But uh, it's also, they've got like, really nice stuff. So you've got these interactive objects. You know, you've got like, these, these live music sequences where you, you push a little button and a little thing goes off. Really cool. But you also get to uh, collaborate with people in different spaces. And there's a really nice but a lot of play going on there. This is my favorite thing ever. This is cool. This is a uh, Fry's Walk shopping center in Reading. So it's a shopping center. Didn't really work out as a shopping center. It closed down. All the shops have cleared out. But then some people reappropriated it, took the kind of the structure of it, and now they use it for zombie survival sessions. So what happens is <laughs> you go along and you get handed a toy Nerf gun that fires little foam darts, and then you have to run around and survive down all like, the little back roads and all the little bits of the shop that are emptied out. And people dressed as zombies chase you and try to eat you. <laughs> like, it's amazing. So they've, they've taken something that was broken, and they've completely reappropriated it and made it into something really brilliant and really experiential. And I just want to finish with two points off the back of that. The first one is, if you're a designer, maker, creative person, or if you're, if you're a, a manufacturer and you make stuff, if, if you think about what the end product is that you're trying to do, like who you're trying to appeal to and what you're trying to get them uh, to feel or think or sense, is there a more direct way of you doing that other than the service you offer at the moment? Is there a way you can actually just you know, cut out all of the middle stuff and just get in there and just make them feel something? And that's a sentiment that I'm uh, echoing off Gilmore and Pine, who wrote the... Uh, experience economy a few years ago. The second thing is, just to everyone else, just go out and try stuff, you know? Go out, like, like take a few risks. If you see something that doesn't fit into a category, that doesn't exist, like, yeah, go along, check it out, see what it's like. You know, it might be really fun, it might be amazing. And it just, keep, it just encourages that, that culture of trying new stuff out in city spaces. Uh, and that's it, so thank you very much. Cheers.